All right, looks like we've got a lot of people here. Get a couple people to introduce themselves. Um, uh, Dr. Schaefer, I'm the Associate Department Head for Graduate Studies, and the grad school calls me a program director. Um, I'll introduce a couple of other people. Um, Sarah Hushangi is here. You want to say hello? Sure. Hi, I'm Dr. Hushangi. I'm the director of the Master of Engineering program. And not in, a, in our online world, this doesn't make a huge difference, but I'm in Blacksburg and she's in Northern Virginia. Well, we answer email anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Anywhere, anytime, right? Yeah. All right. And then uh, let me introduce Samantha Pipkin. Hi, everybody. It's Hi. good to see you all. Um, she is one of, it, it, it's, it, it's, uh, keeping track of all the people can start to get a little confusing. But she is one of three what's called graduate or program coordinators. Um, she's also in Northern Virginia, and, and the MEng program is her prime responsibility. Um, Sharon Kinder Potter, a lot of you have interacted with. She's the program coordinator down here in Blacksburg, um, but she's got she's unable to come today. Um, and then. Um, you, a few of you may have heard from Roxanne Paul. She's also in Northern Virginia, and her, she's kind of between us and ECE. She works for both departments, and she generally does things for uh, the masters and PhD students in Northern Virginia. All right, so welcome to Roxanne is also here. So do you want to introduce? Oh, her? is she? Okay, um, sure. Go ahead. Um, I guess I should turn this off. Okay. Hi, Roxanne. Here we are. <laughs> Sorry about Hello. that, everybody. Hi, I'm actually in the office today, mm -hmm. but I wanted to welcome all the new students and especially mm -hmm. send a shout out to the new NCR um, okay. MS and PhD students. And we look forward to talking to you on Friday. Right. So there's actually, we have three orientation sessions. This is kind of the general one. Um, and then there's one for the MEng program, and there's one for the Northern Virginia research students. That'll, so the MEng program is tomorrow at six, and the one for the Northern Virginia MS and PhD students is on Friday at ten. Right. Yes. And the other person I want to introduce is uh, Dwight Barnett. You want to say hello? Hello, everyone. Uh, so I'm the director of academic operations in the department. I'm the person who decides uh, upon uh, which course you are assigned to as a GTA. And so that means that every semester, I will need you to be sure to fill out the uh, GTA uh, application form. Uh, that form will be online. It'll get updated uh, usually a couple months or a month or so into the semester. I'll go ahead and post up I know all of you probably have it anyway, but there's the URL uh, to the page that contains information about being a GTA and also contains links to the GTA application survey form. Uh, I'll be updating that form probably around the end of September. I will start sending out emails. I'll usually send out three or four emails during the semester after about a month and a half or so into the semester. Uh, reminding you that it's time that if you're not on a GRA and that if you think you might be uh, needing uh, GTA support for the coming springs or uh, coming semester to be sure and fill out the form. Uh, and then uh, we try, uh, Professor Schaefer and myself uh, working together, try to get out the uh, GTA uh, contracts that we're going to be awarding and the assignments as soon as possible. Our uh, focus is always getting out the contracts first uh, because we know that you're all anxious to get that funding. And so we, we work on that first and the course assignments come, come at a later date. We're not, uh, though, those take a back seat to getting out the uh, contracts. Uh, there are a bunch of factors that go into making the decisions. There's a bunch of factors that go into deciding upon the contracts. Um, 
Dr. Schaefer can talk about those, or if he likes, I can talk about them some. But uh, for the most part, uh, you have to make sure, obviously, that you're doing well in your courses, you're keeping up with your uh, progress towards the degree, you're submitting your required documents like your plan of study, uh, et cetera, passing your prelims if you're going for the PhD. Um, so a lot of those different factors are what we take into account. Uh, so welcome to the department. Your uh, immediate supervisor, your GTA, if you are on a GTA uh, this fall and, or in the future, your immediate supervisor will always be the course instructor. And usually after, once I make the course assignments, uh, once we've done the awarding of the contracts and then at a later date when I make the course assignments, I will send you out an email uh, uh, indicating to which course you are assigned to as a GTA. I do that obviously based upon the uh, um, data that you give me through the GTA application form um, and the background necessary for the course and that the type of GTA that an instructor is looking for. But uh, I will always copy the course instructor uh, on those emails so that you know that they're your direct supervisor. They're the ones that you have to work with, obviously, in doing the grading, uh, in setting your office hours, uh, and even helping them out with the uh, teaching of the course as they see fit and necessary. So right. uh, if you've got any questions at any time during the semester that your immediate supervisor can't answer, feel free to email me. And I'll go ahead and turn now back over to Dr. Schaefer. All right, thank you. All right, let me get this thing uh, screen shared again. So what I'm going to do today is I'm going to give you some intro to who, what's who's who in the department. You've met most of the people already. I'll talk about the relationship of the department with the graduate school. We'll talk a little bit about mechanics of getting you set up for classes, although a lot of that's been taken care of. Um, and Dr. Shangi will give an introduction to the MEng program. Um, and then I'll uh, outline the, the MS and PhD programs and some issues related to keeping good progress on the research track students. And uh, along the way, there'll be a bunch of you know, bits of information that will hopefully be helpful. Uh, there was a question about um, being able to see the recording from this and other information. Let's see if I got this right. Okay, so um, there's the URL here that takes you to this page, which gives you um, various useful getting started information. And I'll post the slide deck here. I haven't done it just yet. I'll do that after the session. And we'll post the recording here as well. All right, a couple of things about um, COVID-19, since this is kind of dominating our lives at the moment about how things get set up and how things operate. If you haven't already seen it, the main page that the university uses to communicate information is this ready.vt.edu. And so it's, they, they, it, it changes a little every day, um, but they've got it set up so that there's a lot of facts and um, you know things about what they're doing and what you expect you to do and, and so on. Um, I've been looking at a couple of the classrooms like today, uh, the classroom we use for, you normally use for grad seminar as, as in, for instance, that's a big lecture hall that I think has close to 300 seats and they've gone in and blocked off most of the seats. So there's, I guess there's about 50 seats. That's the max capacity rating for that room. And that's typical for all the classrooms uh, that they'll be using for any face-to-face -face classes. Um, they've changed the, they've reconfigured the rooms to, um, so that uh, it, it only allows the rated capacity for that room. Um, so that they keep the social distancing and everything. Um, so that's been quite a, a big effort that's going on here. Um, and then last thing I want to say about this, basically, if you're on campus, you should be wearing a mask. There just really isn't any, that, that's a real simple rule and, and that takes care of 99% of the cases. All right. Uh, I also wanted to say our department um, stance is 
we want to give people opportunities for a variety of interactions, but we don't want to force anybody into anything that they might feel uncomfortable with. So there's a couple of classes that are going to operate face to face and they're kind of normal in that, you know, you got to come to those particular meetings. Um, there's, if you don't want to do that, then that might not be a good class to take this semester. There's only a few of those. There's other classes, like for example, um, I, I'm doing grad seminar this way. We're going to try and do a few live sessions, but no one's obligated to come. We'll, we'll record them and broadcast them. You can either join synchronously on Zoom or um, watch the video later. So that's kind of a typical way that things are going. We want to give people chances to interact personally if they want to, but we want to keep everybody in a situation where they don't have to if they don't want to. So one thing I want to point out up front is you're starting a new program and there is an awful lot to learn, uh, especially for the, the research track students um, who have to do courses, which at this point you're all pretty good at doing courses or you wouldn't be here. Um, but you're also picking up how to do research, um, how to how to switch from a role where you're mostly a student to a role where you're wearing a lot of hats. That's uh, one of the defining features of graduate student life is you tend to be doing a, a lot of things in a lot of roles. You might be a GTA, you might be uh, become a senior member of your research group and you might be helping to supervise newer students um, all at the same time while you're being a student. Um, so there's a, that's a lot to pick up, a lot of different uh, proficiencies to get. And so the thing to understand is you can't know, you can't expect, to, you're not expected to know everything walking in the door here. You don't just know every, everything. Nobody expects you to or requires you to. So there's lots of sources of help. And I'll be going over certain things today, but there's a lot that I won't be covering. One piece of advice is, you know, find people who've been in the program for a while who can answer your questions when you need them. I mean, you can certainly ask me or Dr. Ashangi or the graduate program coordinators or faculty questions, but sometimes the best answers are gonna come from another student. Um, and I hope uh, a little later, um, Shakaba, who's the current grad council president, uh, will be here and can tell you a little bit about grad council, but that's a great place to, to get information. And let me show you, uh, this is the grad council homepage. Um, and I guess I'll, I'll, I'll wait till Shakaba's here to let her talk a little bit about what they do. All right. So this is a bunch of mugshots for a bunch of people that are important in the program. Um, so this is me. Again, my official title is Associate Department of Graduate Studies and the grad school calls me a program director. Dr. Ushangi is also a, a program director for the MEng program. And so we sign lots of pieces of paper. Um, eventually, a lot of things come to us and um, you may have a plan of study that needs signed or transfer forms or all sorts of things. Uh, Dr. Ribbons is our department head. You don't interact with him directly a whole lot. Um, he's gonna also come by hopefully around three and say hello. Uh, you've met uh, Dwight Barnett, who um, manages the GTA program. Um, two of our grad coordinators, I need to put Roxanne's in here too. Yeah. Um, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> well, I'll fix that before I post it. Um, so two of our three graduate co coordinators, they're the people you interact with day to day um, with, um, you know, you may send the paperwork to them first, they'll then forward it to those of us who need to sign it, depending on who's appropriate. Um, and I thought that I had changed, in fact, I'm sure I changed this, all right. Um, you, 
for graduate advising, um, if you're in the if you're MNG, then you talk to Dr. Shangi. If you're um, on the research track, um, I'm kind of the backup advisor, and initially I'm probably going to be who most people talk to. But the idea is for research track students, you will hopefully sooner rather than later, but at some point establish a relationship with your research advisor, who is your primary you know, interface and contact, and they don't know all the ins and outs of the details of all the rules. That's more, you know, my job and Dr. Yushangi's job and the grad coordinator's jobs. Um, but they, the, the research advisor hopefully can, can handle a lot of this for you. All right. Here we go. Just a second. One problem with Zoom is it's a little hard to manage all the windows and see the chat and all the rest of this. Uh, if you're on Blacksburg campus, um, some of this doesn't matter as much as it used to if a lot of the stuff is being on Zoom, but uh, when you need physical presence, uh, on campus at the moment, the department is split. The main building for about two thirds of the department is in something called a corporate research center in a building called Knowledge Works Two, which so this is the the acronym you usually see KWII. It's got the main CS department office. It's where a, a lot of research labs are, research groups hang out there. All the administrative uh, faculty and so on are there. Sharon is there. Uh, the other main building that, that we have online is McBride and Torgerson. I'm in Torgerson right now. Uh, it's where my office is. Uh, it's about where a third of the department is. Uh, some of the research groups are there. Compu computational biology and bioinformatics group is there, for example. Um, and then McBride is kind of the undergraduate footprint, but not so much this semester. Um, in a normal semester, that's where the undergrad lab would be. That's where the TAs would usually be. Um, but all of that's gonna be online this semester. And then some faculty are in the Moss Art Center. We have a, a lot of interaction with them, uh, creativity in the arts, uh, computation, computational support there. Um, so there's a lot of things going on. So that's, that's where some of our people are hanging out, some of the grad students. I want to point you to a really important piece of information, source for information, and that is the homepage for the graduate programs. This is where all the rules are published. Um, so there's, there's a lot to learn here. Um, you should start reviewing this. You should look at the page for your program. Um, sort of walk through this, take a look at things, poke around, see what's there. Um, it answers a lot of questions. Uh, there's some links to some other things like grad council, um, just a lot of different things, all right? So that's, and, and in particular, for example, this has, this is where you go to see the details. So if you're in the PhD program, you want to know about your course requirements and the various milestones, you know, I'll, I'll do a little overview of that, but this is where all the details are. This is where the official posting of all the rules are for the department. And then, uh, so how, how do things work? I mean, so we're a big university. That means we're a big bureaucracy. Big bureaucracies have lots of paperwork. So um, again, you probably are so often going to be sending questions to Dr. Ribbons. More likely you'd be sending it to one of the grad coordinators or to one of the program directors, or if it's something related to, to uh, GTA job, then uh, Mr. Barnett. Um, so the, these people here are, are ones who are getting a lot of your paperwork. A little bit about the department. Uh, at the moment, we have 47 tenure track faculty, uh, 40 in Blacksburg, seven in NCR. We also have a number of people um, who are teaching faculty, uh, what's called a collegiate uh, faculty. Uh, 
and I think there's about 10 of them at the moment, were we hired about 10 people this year. Um, and not all of them are, are, are coming this semester. Some of them are joining in fall, but we're hiring a lot. Um, so we're expecting to grow. Our program is supposed to grow. Um, so give you some sense of how big the program is now. Um, two years ago, when I showed this slide, we had just cracked the thousand students. Oops. And now, two years later, I'm saying 1,500. So that shows you some sense of how quickly the department's been growing. We're over 1,200 undergrads. This uh, it should be fall 20. As of fall 20, we're at 1,200. Um, we have about 50 Master of Engineering students now. That program officially was approved last fall. So uh, we had a few students join in spring, but most of them have joined this fall. So that program is, is hope to grow to about 700 is kind of the target. And we would have had a lot more than 50, but um, a lot of students had to defer because, they, uh, because of COVID and, and visa issues and so on. So we hope to have another increment of students at this spring, but at the moment we've got 50 students in the MEng program. Um, we have about 100 MS students and about 175 PhD students. Um, so all together, we're about a bit over 300 students who are officially enrolled at the moment. And again, uh, that should go up again in spring. To give you some sense of, of sort of going out the other end, which is what you're all aspiring to, uh, we're averaging about 50 master's degrees um, per year, and we're averaging about 30 PhDs per year. And in particular, the master's is, is intended to grow. This year, we had about 900 applications. Um, we have about 100 new students this fall. We have, um, uh, actually, I think a record intake this fall, um, which again, isn't as high as we were hoping to grow a lot more than that, but uh, mostly in the MEng program. Um, but again, we hope a lot of those people will be able to come this spring. To give you some sense of the scale of the research enterprise, these numbers might or might not mean anything to you, but, um, and again, I think this, I, this should have been updated to 20. This is the 20 number. I just forgot to update this number here. So we're running about 12 million, um, you know, new grants coming in each year, and 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 that's about how much we spend each year on grants. So we're a pretty big, pretty big uh, enterprise as far as the research goes. We also have a, a corporate sponsors program. Um, something it's called CS Source. There's about 90 participants in that. The thing that you see the most there uh, is when we do uh, career fairs. And we do big career fairs every fall and every spring, uh, often in conjunction with the rest of the College of Engineering. I assume those are planned to be virtual this, uh, this fall. I don't know about next spring, but uh, normally that's a, a big event each semester. Um, and you get this you know, huge room in the student union building squires here that um, has all these booths type thing. Again, we're not gonna do that this fall, but uh, we will definitely have an, a career fair this fall. So a couple of, of details, many of which you may already know, but to help you make sure you get the terminology straight and, and, and understand when we use the rules, there's two main pieces of university identification. So there's something called a PID, and you, you'll probably hear that a lot. The PID is basically your email address is a way to think about it. Your email address is PID at bt.edu. So for example, my PID is Schaefer. My BT email address is Schaefer at bt.edu. And then I also have a department account at cs.bt.edu, which I'll talk a little more about soon. The other identifier is a number. So that's your student ID or your Hokie passport number. So everyone is, hopefully is, has gotten their, their ID card. 
you should consider this um, a piece of information you want to keep private. Think of it kind of like a social security number or something like that. Um, and, in this, and, and the university super frowns on people sending that number across the, across the email. You'll notice that, for example, uh, when we were doing force ads and stuff, I asked you, what are the last four digits of your ID number? Um, and I really meant I only want the last four digits because that's that helps uh, whoever's doing like the four sat or whatever to to make sure it's it's the right John Doe they came up with when people have, you know share names and the like. Uh, but we don't want the whole thing. We won't don't want to email the whole thing. And if you're a GTA, um, drill this into your brain. GTAs do never do, don't send. Um, full ID numbers of students, don't send spreadsheets with ID numbers of students or anything like that across the mail. Um, there's, they consider Google Docs secure, but they don't consider Gmail secure. Go figure, but that's the way the rule works. All right, so just keep track when, whether someone's asking you for your PID or your ID number. And then about the emails, uh, a couple of things to say. Um, so it's really important that you are having access to your PID at bt.edu email and that you're reading it every time you normally read your email. In other words, you've, you've been living your life for years, you've got some email account that you use. Um, I'm not saying you've got to give that up and use this instead. What I'm saying is whatever way you read your mail, you better make sure that this PID at bt.edu mail is going into that channel. So it's really critical that you forward it or whatever you need to do so that you're not in the situation where you're missing emails that come to this, right? So if you read your email every day or every other day or whatever it is, when you read your email, you need to see this email and you don't want to be, oh, I got to remember to log into some separate account to read this. It's got to get forwarded. It's got to be in your regular stream. Uh, there's another account that you can get, and most people do. Most uh, This is managed by the CS department. And uh, whoops, these uh, acronyms can get a little um, confusing They don't because they don't intrinsically mean a whole lot to you. But when you see CAS account, that's the university account. That has to do with the login system that they use. Um, then the department has something called an SLO or single login account. Um, so that's your at cs.bt.edu account. So if you go to admin.cs.bt.edu, there's a, uh, a link there that says uh, create account. And so you can set that up. One nice perk of that is that gives you web hosting services that you can post your own pages and have them available on the internet. All right. And uh, you probably already uh, getting spammed by my various emails uh, from, from a whole bunch of us, different things. There's a couple of different listservs, and right now I've kind of thrown everybody onto the main listserv, and we'll sort that out a little, a little better. Um, there are separate uh, listservs for Blacksburg students versus Northern Virginia students, um, and we'll, we'll bifurcate those a little more cleanly in the near future. But at the moment, I just threw everybody onto the one listserv, so I'd make sure everyone got things about orientation and so on. Uh, the department keeps various um, uh, uh, social media things, you know, Facebook and LinkedIn and all that. There's a CS department, Slack channel, and so on. So all, all of those things are there. Uh, let me tell you the relationship between the grad school and the CS department. So not, you know, different schools are a little different in the way they do that, particularly those of you who came with a master's degree from somewhere else. Uh, Maybe they had a different arrangement, but here the graduate school is a sort of a separate entity. Um, and their job is to kind of manage the, the programs, manage a lot of the paperwork, um, and set the basic rules that the departments operate under. So they handle admissions, 
They define basic policies that all the programs follow. They define minimum requirements that all the programs follow. And technically, you do not get a degree from the CS department. You will get a degree from the graduate school. Um, and on our side, we do the teaching, we do direct advising, we supervise research, and we have our local, we, we define the, the, the flesh on the bones. So the, the grad school defines the bones of the program, like all PhD programs look like this, and all MS programs or MNG programs look like that. And then we set the actual details. Now, why this matters is sometimes issues come up and you might ask a question, you might need to see whether something is acceptable under the rules. Maybe you've got a legitimate case for an exception under the rules that happens sometimes. And probably the first thing you're gonna do, is, let's say you need an exception to something. The first thing you're probably gonna do is ask me or, or, or ask one of the program coordinators or Dr. Ushmangi. Um, and you'll ask us and, and maybe we can resolve it, but it depends on whose rule it is. So for instance, if you wanna know, um, well, could I switch this course for that course? Could I have another Cognate course or something like that? Well, that's the department made that rule. And so the department might or might not agree to, 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 to modify something in your case. Maybe your question is, well, can I transfer more than the stated number of transfer courses for whatever reason? And you come to me and you ask me that, and my answer is, well, I don't control that rule. That's a grad school rule. It's the grad school that decides um, how many courses you can transfer, how many double counts you can count towards multiple degrees, things like that. I don't control that. And in that case, I'd have to say, well, you'll have to go talk to the grad school about that, and they may or, or might not be willing to, to give you an exception. So some rules I own, some rules the grad school owns, um, and who owns it depends on who can change it. So that's why that's important. Um, some points of contact. Um, a lot of you already are familiar with Cranwell International Center. And in fact, they uh, are playing a bigger role now because it used to be that the, um, the team that deals with things like I-20s and, and information about uh, international students and so on used to be housed in the grad school. And, and this year they moved that to the Cranwell Center. So I-20s come out of there. They don't come out of the grad school anymore, for example. So that's for those of you who, who um, you know, visa and so on, that you probably are pretty familiar with them already. Cook Counseling Center um, has two, uh, a lot of different tasks, but two major tasks are things related to any sort of uh, mental health and counseling. And they also have a lot of support for like academic skill building and so on, study habits, things like that. So they're, they, they're pretty important uh, entity on campus and you might check out what they can and do, what the what they can do for you. Um, then the graduate school has a position called the graduate student ombud person. Um, if there is some kind of a conflict uh, going on, um, that he may be the person who you might want to talk to to resolve it. A lot of things in the department, you know, a lot of times maybe there's a conflict between uh, a student and a faculty member for some of them, maybe it's a research advisor or an instructor, or if they're, um, uh, maybe they're the, the, you're a GTA and there's the instructor of record and, and so you're immediate boss for that purpose. Um, a lot of times if there's an issue that needs resolved, you, you'd come to me or you'd come to uh, Dwight Barnett if it's, um, related to GTA assignments and so on. But sometimes there are things that you don't want to handle that way. Um, he's the person you would talk to. Uh, and we're a big department. Um, you know, we don't, we don't have, we don't give him a lot of cases, but we give them our share of cases considering how big we are. Um, so he's used to dealing with us. 
and uh, depending on what's going on, he he may or may not come back to me for clarification or help with something, um, or he may not, depending on what the what the situation is. So good to be good to know about about him. Most people don't need his services, but it's good to know he's there. And then there's lots of other. But again, Virginia Tech is a big school. That means it's a big bureaucracy, which means there's lots of administrative offices that you may come in contact with. Um, again, the, the grad school is housed over in what's called the Graduate Life Center or GLC building. Um, if you know where Squires is, the right cross from that. Um, they, th there's an Obam pen in Squires and the Graduate Life Center has its own Obal pen. That's a, a local coffee shop or not. That's a big chain actually, that's a coffee shop. So there's a lot of coffee shops in Blacksburg. Um, they also house the offices for the Graduate Student Association at the university level. So I mentioned Grad Council before, that's at the, the department Grad Council and then the University Graduate Student Association. And of course we have um, sort of delegates that, that uh, from CS to that entity. All right, so um, normally, this the next next thing is a really big deal. Next thing when I talk about signing up for classes, but actually this isn't quite so big a deal this year because we've done most of that already. So normally, well, every year we have this problem. Um, particular, well, both in Blacksburg and Northern Virginia, the new students. Um, if you think about all the people sitting in all of the classes in CS, the new students represent about a third of the of the people in any given class. But uh, like any university, and you probably are familiar with this from your undergraduate days, uh, there's usually like a pre-registration session. There's, a, there's an opportunity during the previous semester to register for your classes. But the new students don't get that chance. So what we do is we um, let the continuing students, they get to pre-register for classes that for fall, that would have probably been last April. And we, from that, try and set some initial sizes for these classes and estimate enrollment. And then we lock down the caps on them so that then we can go through a process to let you folks have your chance to get into the classes before all the good classes are, have been filled up. And normally, well, I don't wanna say normal because I don't think we'll ever go back to this process before, but before this semester, um, this orientation session would have been your first opportunity to sign up for classes, but instead we did that all online. So most of you probably remember I sent out email and I asked you to send me, fill out a, I asked you to fill out a survey of list of courses you want. We then did our best to get everybody into classes. So at this point, you're mostly in your classes, um, but there's still a lot of chance to adjust. So let's talk about the mechanics and, and how you can do that. So as you're probably already aware, there's a course number like CS5204, and then associated with that is something called a uh, course request number. And so next year, 5204 might be taught again, but it will probably be bound to a different course request number. So that's like an index number for the, the registrar's office. And that identifies concretely the particular section. So for example, this year there might be um, a version of the class that's being taught in Blacksburg and a version that's taught in Northern Virginia and a version that's taught online. And they're really the same class. They're taught by the same instructor at the same time through the same Zoom session and the same Canvas course shell. But because you might be having a reason why you need to take a class that's tied to a particular campus or tied to online, you might be in one section or another. Sometimes there are literally two copies of the class taught by different instructors at different times. And again, to sort out which is which, that's what the CRN does. It's a unique identifier for every section. Um, there's a listing of courses at this URL. That's sort of the nominal, that in the abstract, that's what uh, is on the books, but we don't teach all of them every semester. So what gets taught this semester is at the timetable of classes. And again, I assume you're pretty familiar with that. Now, every class has its own permission set as to who can enroll for it online automatically. And some you can't enroll automatically. So for example, 
you can't go online and add yourself to an independent study class because there's a paperwork process that you have to go through for that. Um, other things you might not be able to get on to because there is a department restriction or a, or a level restriction. So maybe you're um, an undergrad in the accelerated undergrad graduate program and you're still in your undergrad year and you wanted to register for grad seminar, but it may be locked to graduate students, so you can't do it. Or maybe it's what's called one of these MIT classes. That's a, an online master's degree. But we teach courses in that program, and some of them are available to regular grad students. But the MIT program may have locked it so that you can't get in, right? So the timetable will tell you what's being taught. And it may allow you to register, but you may not, and you may need intervention to get you into the class. You've probably encountered some of this already. Uh, this is what went away. So we're not right now. We've already done this. You've already um, done the initial cut. You've already hopefully got into most of your classes. So it, what, if you aren't in a class that you want, then there's two possibilities. One is that you just go online and you add it. That's the, that's the happy situation. The other possibility is that you go online and for whatever reason you can't add it. <clears throat> it's possible that it's already reached its cap. It's possible that you just aren't in whatever bucket the registrar has set up that can add that automatically. In that case, you need to deal with what's called a force add. Um, and every class is unique in that respect. Let's see if I can get this to come up. Here we go. Um, so this page here um, lists the policy for a number of classes where if someone has decided, they told me that well, this is how I want to handle it. The default is if you want in a class, send email to the instructor um, and they'll, they'll decide whatever they're going to do. It's up to them basically. Um, a few classes that are pretty large, um, they've set up, for example, um, let's see, let's see one, a couple of the big classes, advanced machine learning. Dr. Eldadari has set up a survey because she's got just so many of these she's got to deal with. So sending her email isn't going to help much. What she wants is for you to fill out this survey. So this page here will tell you if there's any special rules operating for that class. Sometimes it's just email the instructor. And when you email them generally, um, the instructor um, may not keep in their head what the CRNs are, and they might have multiple CRNs. So you should tell them the CRN, and you should give them the last four digits of your student ID so that they can bundle these up, pass them on to whoever's actually going to do the four ads, which probably will be Samantha who does most of the four ads. All right. But only if the instructor approved it. All right. And if the instructor says, I'm sorry, I'm full, then um, that's, that's their answer. Uh, this is useful. Every year there are some special topics classes. They're basically one-shot deals. Uh, that class might not be taught in that form again. Um, so it's good to be aware of them in any given semester. Um, so this semester, I guess we've got uh, a small handful of those. All right. And they're in the timetable, of course, but this gives you more information. So you might want to know, oh, what's going on here? This will take you to some information that will give you more details about that special class. All right. At this point, um, I'm going to turn it over and to talk about the Master of Engineering program. Um, and here's the link and, and so on. Uh, I guess tell me just what you want me to advance the slides. So. Again, thank you, everybody. My name is Sarah Hushangi. I'm the director of the Master of Engineering program uh, in the CS department, and I'm handling both the folks that are in Northern Virginia and also the Blacksburg folks that are in Master of Engineering. As I had mentioned in the emails that I sent to the MN students, we will have another orientation session tomorrow night at 6 p.m. I told people if you come today, you don't have to come to the other one. Most of, a lot of the material is going to be uh, similar but there will be some specific MEng, uh, you know, we talk basically just about the MEng program. And as I said, if you are, but you were on my email list, which is, should be everybody who is uh, 
and I meant students, you should have gotten an email with the Zoom link, but if you don't have it, we can always send it to you as well. So go ahead. Next slide. All right, so the Master of Engineering or MN for short is the course only master option within our department. It used to be that you can get an MS uh, coursework only uh, program, but that is gone now. So if you wanna do a course only master's program, you need to be in the Master of Engineering. We do have uh, once in a while students that are in the master, the MS program, the Master of Science thesis one that they just don't wanna do a thesis. If you wanna do that, you do have to switch. And there are like every, everything else here, there's a form that needs to be filled out. But uh, so this program is only 30 credits. So that's 10 courses. Each course in our program is uh, three credits. There are certain requirements that are part of the MNG program that you have to satisfy to get your degree. There is an ethics in a CS course that you have to take and most students end up taking that course in their first semester. There's a capstone course. Um, and that course usually should be done during your final semester with us or the final year. Uh, then you take three courses in one of the concentration areas. And in addition to that, obviously you do five additional courses and the total becomes 10. Uh, as part of the Master of Engineering program, we require people to take the CS 5040, which is the Intermediate Data Structure course, unless you have an undergraduate degree in CS. So, Again, I know some of you have contacted me. If you don't have a CS background, you must take CS 5040 as part of those five additional courses. And this is something that we actually kind of follow up with you in your plan of study. There is no external requirements, seminars or projects that you have to do as part of the MN. So everything is uh, captured within the 30 credits that you're doing. And uh, the main reason for this MN, new MN uh, program uh, for the program, for the department, is that we want to prepare students for skills that would give uh, them advantage in for mid-level advanced industry positions. So the goal is that you get your master's degree in a year or two, and then you finish and you go off and get a fabulous job at one of these big companies or startups or wherever you want to work. Next slide, please. So that's me, isn't it? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So as I said, uh, this, this is the question that I get sometimes, how many courses do you want to take if you're a master's of engineering student? Depends if you're full-time or part-time. We do have some of the people who work full-time and they want to do this part-time. So you can take one or two courses per semester and it would take them a few years to finish this degree. If you are a full-time student and you want to get faster, you, you want to get done faster, you can take three or four courses and that uh, makes you full-time. So, from the graduate uh, school standpoint, if you take three classes, so nine credits, you are full time. Some international students decide to take uh, 12 credits as well. So, you know, if you want to complete faster, if you want to do an accelerated program, we, you can take four courses during the fall and uh, spring semester, and then maybe two courses over the summer to get done. So that will be one option. Um, you can also just span it out over two years. The majority of full-time students, especially international students, again, uh, they tend to stay for two years because many of them want to do an internship over the summer. So you can definitely be full-time and finish this program in two years. And if, as I said, you want to do part-time, you can take one course or two course uh, per semester, and then you get done in a few years. And if you have any questions about how many courses you should take, what is a good schedule, you can always schedule a time to talk to me and we can go over uh, the options that you might have. Next slide, please. Do I have any more? Yes. So we have a few concentrations uh, that uh, you can focus on. And the, the reason that we've chosen these concentration is that because most of these concentrations are area that are kind of hot in the CS field right now. Again, we want to make sure that you have an advantage and can get a job after you get done. So data analytics and machine learning, obviously very popular. Computer security or cybersecurity is another one. We have an AI track, there's a software engineering track, where most of the classes are actually fully online, even without a pandemic. Uh, we have an internet software developing uh, track and also human computer interaction. These uh, tracks or concentrations are actually kind of evolving. So this is like the initial set that we have right now. As we, the MNG program changes over the next few years, we might actually slightly uh, change these concentrations. But for now, 
uh, if you go to the MN website, we do have the list of courses that are listed under each one of these concentrations. And I believe, again, since this year, most of the classes are not, all the classes are offered. In Northern Virginia, we don't have as many courses as in Blacksburg. So there is some uh, limitations up there, but I believe most of the concentration at this point should be even up in Northern Virginia. And as I said, most classes, are, all classes are actually online in Northern Virginia right now. So you have more options this year. All right, next slide. If I have anything, yes, right. So this is again for just the Master of Engineering students. I want to reiterate the point of contacts and who you should talk to at any given time. You can send an email to everybody, but that's not very effective. The first person that you should talk to for your day-to-day -day request should be Samantha. If there's something that I need to get involved or Dr. Schaefer needs to get involved, she can always send us an email and get us involved. But she is the first person that you want to talk to. If you were you have a problem with registering for classes, if there's a form that needs to be uh, signed, if there is you know, something else that you have a question about. If you don't know anything about international students, uh, uh, what is that, issues related to international students and visa issues. So those, you have an advisor. If you're in Northern Virginia, it's Jessica. If it's uh, Blacksburg, you have to go through the Cranville International Student Office. So for those questions, financial aid and visa issues, we can help you. We, so you, you, and you have other people in the university that can help you with that. But any other related matter to the department, you should start with Samantha. And then uh, again, for MN, I would get involved as an advisor. And again, Samantha is only responsible for the MN students. For MS and PhD students, there's Roxanne up here for Northern Virginia. And then we have Sharon down in uh, Blacksburg. And I'm sure you know, you're gonna talk about that later. But again, if you need questions about what courses to take, you can contact me and we can set up a time. Uh, to chat. But in general, again, start with Samantha and take it from there. And check your VT email. We still have a few people that are not checking their VTs. That's where you get your bill. You got to pay your uh, tuition bill. So make sure to check that. So let, me that be... let me rephrase that a little bit. Don't check your VT email. You shouldn't have to check your yeah. VT email because your VT email should be coming to your main email stream. So forward your VT email. Yes. Yeah. Make sure it's you, you're seeing it somehow. Mm -hmm. All right, so I think that might be my only slide. Do I have any more? I don't know. No. Nope. There we go. All right, thank you. So All right, so again, at this point, if you're an MN student, I think they can leave, right? Well, <laughs> or is there give them, uh, uh, hang on, one more thing. Uh, I would like to introduce Shakaba, uh, if she's late. I, uh, why I don't, think she's off. Why don't you make your pitch about grad council and then the MN students? don't need to hang around after that. Okay, thanks. Uh, hi everyone, I'm Shakiba. I'm the president of Grad Council. And so just a little bit about Grad Council. A few years ago, some of our students started the um, uh, Grad Council here at VT, which is mainly uh, provide, uh, trying to provide an interface between the grad students and the department. And as far as I know, we're one of the few or even the only department that has a grad council. Uh, so far, there's been a lot of support from the department and doc Dr. Schaefer and everyone, which uh, has helped us to be more successful, help the grad council to be more successful. Uh, we try to, uh, if there are any uh, problems or concerns that uh, you have as a grad student, we try to share them with the department and come up with solutions for them. We organize different social events, panels with alumni, faculty, recruiters, and everything about like uh, industry job, academic jobs. Um, Last year, one of the biggest things that uh, got done by the help of the department and grad council was to make some change to the handbook and to graduation requirements and reducing some, the number of courses and everything. So you can see like uh, we can have like a uh, direct impact on your life. Um, and we just try to make life easier for grad students. Uh, well, of course, it's a um, student organization, so we need your um, we need you to get involved. I believe Dr. Schaefer has shared the website with everybody. If not, you can just like look up um, VT 
grad council, CS grad council, and just uh, um, find the website. And there's a lot of good information about travel funding, housing, our meetings and events, everything on the website. And once the semester starts, we're gonna have bi-weekly meetings. And you, I highly recommend everybody to join the meetings. So then if we're making any decisions for the graduate students, you can be part of the decision making. And you can give us feedback if there's any problems that you have, either there's already a solution for it and we can help you find it, or if there isn't, we can try to come up with uh, good solutions for it. And if you like, you can just get involved in planning and organization and everything and then hopefully get ready to take over the office for the next year. Yeah, that's for me. All right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. All right. So, um, let me just check on that here real quick. All right. Hopefully Dr. Ribbons will stop by um, soon, um, but uh, I'll, I'll get started on, um, things related to MS and PhD and sort of the, I'll call the research track. Uh, when Dr. Ribbons comes, I'll uh, give, him, give him a chance to say hello to everybody. Let me, uh, let's see, I switched my buttons around a little bit. So there we go. So again, for the MN students, um, you, you can hang around and listen to this if you like, but you, uh, shouldn't, this will probably take a little while to get through and it won't be quite as relevant to you. Um, so there'll be more detailed orientation for you tomorrow. Okay, if you are on the research track, you're either in the MS program and you'll do, which means that you'll do a thesis or you're in the PhD program, then um, first thing, um, how many courses should you be taking as a new research track student? Well, there's courses and there's credit hours. So for the courses, when I say a course, I usually mean a three credit regular course as it were. So I don't mean something like a, a graduate seminar, which is a one credit course, that's kind of in addition. So we typically, if, if, if you are on an assistantship, then you shouldn't take more than two courses. There's no reason why you, you would, there's no point to taking more than two courses. The, the course numbers, so here's, here's the key numbers to keep in mind, uh, back of your mind. PhD students need nine courses. Thesis students need seven courses. So for a thesis student, you're gonna have four semesters to take courses, not even counting a summer. So there's no reason why you would ever take more than two in any given semester. You need the time for other things. For a PhD student, um, if you took two courses every semester, you'd basically be done in two years with your coursework. So again, there's, there's, you, you got things that are, in the long run, more bottleneck for graduation. So your courses are not usually the thing that should be your first top of mind concern for a research track student. Getting your dissertation, your thesis done is really the bottleneck to graduation. And so you don't want courses to get in the way of that. I mean, you need to take them, you need to do well, that's an assumption, that's a given. We assume, you know, you, you've, you've been taking courses for many years, you're good at taking courses. You can't, when I, we may use, we may use words like, well, the courses don't matter. Well, yeah, they matter, you gotta get a decent grade in them. But, you know, over, you know, as an undergrad, if you got perfect A's, you know, that you got maybe an award or something. Basically here, if you're over a three, five, we can't really tell the difference anymore. We don't care anymore. What we care about is, is how your research program is going. That's what to us distinguishes, you know, the good students from the great students. Um, so, don't take, you probably don't need more than two courses. Again, if you're an MEng student, um, then you might wanna take um, maybe four courses, um, however many you think you can handle, because generally the deal is, you know, MEng students, um, they're doing coursework and, and, and they wanna 
you know, graduate more quickly. But for research track students, what's going to be the thing that takes, that's going to slow you down is getting that thesis done or that dissertation done. Now, on the other hand, this sounds like a conflict to start with. On the other hand, if you're full time, particularly if you're on assistantship, you need 12 credits. Well, 12 credits is four courses, but we don't want you taking four courses. So how do you get 12 credits? Well, the answer is there's a couple of side things you might have to do. So if you're a new GTA, maybe you need to take that grad 5004 course and that's a credit. You need to take a couple instances of grad seminar. That's a credit each. But even with those, that doesn't get you to 12. So the answer is you take research hours. So if you're a master's level, it's 59, I'm sorry, not 59, 40. If you're a master's level, it's 59.94. If you're a PhD level, it's 79.94. And you just fill in as many as you need. And you don't have to do anything in particular for them. Uh, just at the end of the semester, we just kind of check the box and there you were and, and you get, you know, you, it's, it's not even a real grade, right? It's just acknowledgement that you took the credits. So that's how you get to your 12 credits, or if you want, it could be 15, right? So once you've paid nine, the price is the same, right? No matter how many credits you take. Um, I, I believe that, um, and it's possible that I'm wrong, but I'm almost certain that assistant students, GTAs, GRAs have to take 12, not just nine. But even if you didn't, you should at least take 12 credits at a minimum. 15 is probably better because it doesn't cost you any more. And a reason to do that is if for some reason you had to drop a class, you don't want to end up short. You don't want to threaten your full-time status. So- And I'll just add, extra. Cliff, I'll just add that you're right. They do have to take at least 12 credits if mm -hmm. they're a graduate assistant. Okay. But even if it's not required, you still want to because you'd hate to drop a class and and somehow end up not being full-time anymore. Right. Okay. Well, which courses? Well, take a look at the degree requirements and I'll talk, I'll, I'll go over that a little bit about the master's and PhD degree requirements. Um, but you will create something called a plan of study and that's the listing of courses for yourself. Um, what, what are the particular set of courses that you're going to take? And that plan of study, if you are an MS student, you need to have that in. You're supposed to have it in it by the end of your second semester. So by next May, you should plan to have completed your plan of study if you're in, if you're in the MS. If you're in the PhD program, you get three semesters to get that done. Um, so that would be by the end of next fall, you would, you would have your... Um, plan a study done for a PhD student. You can change that. Um, there's a form for, for changing and that, that's typical. You should expect, particularly if you're a PhD student, because you're guessing years ahead what courses might or might not be given um, or how things are gonna turn out. Don't sweat over it. Come up with something that satisfies the rules, that sounds plausible. And if you have to adjust some course number later on, um, that's an easy form, that's an easy process. So just assume that that's gonna happen. So um, again, MS, the, 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 the key number from courses is seven and PhD, it's nine. There's a thing called breadth. Um, the, the courses normally are associated with an area. There's like uh, 10 or 11 areas. If you go to the list of courses, um, it'll, it'll tell you for each course what area it's in for regular CS courses. Then there are some other requirements like a uh, minimum number of 6,000 level classes, um, minimum and maximum number of what's called cognate courses. So PhD students get to take between one and three uh, courses that are what's called a cognate. That's a course that is not in CS, but it's something that we've designated as the type of thing that a CS student would find useful. So statistics is a good example. Everybody should probably be taking at least one statistics class and maybe a couple. Um, there's courses in ECE that are cognate courses. There's a lot of cognate courses. There's a bunch of math courses that are cognate courses. 
Um, and we're usually pretty flexible. I'm, I'm, if you come to me and say, there's a reason why I'd like to take this outside course as a cognate, um, I'm pretty receptive to, to adding to adding more courses to the cognate list. So, uh, it, you know, if it's not on the list, you know, feel free to ask. Uh, you are allowed to take, I think, two 4,000 level courses and, and so on. So um, if, you, if you look at the re detailed requirements, it'll, it'll tell you what, uh, it'll list all those out. All right, so this semester, you know, typically you take two courses probably at the 5,000 level. You'd probably take a grad seminar. Um, if you're not on uh, an assistantship of some sort, you might take a third course and then you'd fill out credits with 5994 or 7994. All right. And here's an example of, of uh, you know, there, there's just lots and lots of courses now. And they're not all given every semester, but we, we, get, we give a lot of courses. Um, Another thing to, to mention here, um, so you, you were admitted to a program. You are in a program. You're either in the MS program or the MEng program or the PhD program. Now, there's movement between these things, and that can go in a couple of different ways. So one way that can go is you may have come in to the MS program, and you decide that you would like to get a PhD and you'd like to switch to the PhD program. If you have a research advisor who you know, supports that decision, then that's an easy matter. That's just a form to fill out and we'll do that. You may have entered the PhD program and if you don't already have a master's level degree, you, you know, PhD is a, is a funny thing. It, 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 it takes a while. Typically about five years is normally how long it takes to get a PhD. Um, there's a lot of psychological stress associated with it for a lot of people. It, it's, it's comforting to know you picked up a degree along the way. And so we have exactly that. We have this thing called MS along the way. And so an MS, a PhD student could do an MS thesis and get credit for it that way. We also do have a coursework option in the MS program as opposed to the MEng program that's only available to PhD students who are in essence getting it along the way. And we've got sort of gatekeepers for that. Um, and so if you are in the PhD program, what's called technically direct to PhD, you've got a bachelor's degree, you don't have a master's degree, it's easy to get that MS along the way. And, and most PhD students who don't come with a master's will do that. That's, that's, that's pretty universal. Um, and likewise, if you're in the MS program, you decide you really do want to go on for a PhD, there's basically two ways to do that. You either switch before you get your MS or you get your MS and then you transition immediately after. That could be either way. All right. So, um, the main, and I, and I guess uh, some of these um, I'm, I'm repeating. Um, the, while, the, while there's a bunch of course credit rules, the main thing that you need to keep in mind is, well, an MS student needs to complete a thesis and a PhD student needs to complete a dissertation. And those are the things that if you get delayed in graduation, that'll be the reason why, not your courses. And so you need to, you know, not, you, you got to think like a research track graduate student. It, it's easy to say, you know, I'm used to taking courses and, and now I, I don't know, I, I, I want to do it because I'm used to it. I want to get them out of the way or anything like that isn't the right way of thinking about it. Um, the right way of thinking about it is what is my time to graduation and what do I have to get done? And since the main bottleneck is going to be that dissertation or that thesis, what is the pacing that I need to make sure that I get that on time? 
and what is the expected amount of time? Well, for MS students, it's almost universally two years. There are almost never heard of, but rare occasions where an MS student can do it faster than that. There are some MS students who go into the summer, that, that can happen. Maybe some MS students who get into a fifth semester, that's not common, but it can happen. But most MS students get done in two years. Most of you coming in for the MS now would expect um, that you would graduate in spring 2022, or at worst that you bleed a little bit into the summer to finish your thesis. PhD students is a lot more of a, of a distribution. The typical time to PhD is about five years, and if you come with a master's, you might be able to chop some time off of that. But that's generally nominally what you'd be looking at. And there's a lot of variance around that mean. Some people get it done quicker, some people take longer, right? Everyone's unique in terms of their PhD. And that seems like a long time. Um, that may seem like a long time in the sense of there's a lot of things I don't need to worry about now because you know I got a long time, or that seems like a long haul. I mean, it's it's both of those, but you gotta plan, sort of get in mind what your pacing is going to be now and make sure you stay on track. And we've got mechanisms to try and help you stay on track. And I'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, just checking. Is, is Dr. Ribbons entered the room yet? He has. Let me take a break here and introduce Dr. Ribbons, our department head, and give him a chance to say hello. And then I'll go then I'll get back to talking about how to be a good, successful research track student. <clears throat> Very good, thanks a lot, uh, Cliff. I hope everybody can hear me okay. I uh, apologize that I haven't been able to join, join uh, all of this. I've been bouncing back and forth between meetings as we do nowadays, but I did wanna stop in uh, and say welcome and uh, we're, we're super glad that you're joining our community here, um, whether that's in Northern Virginia or in Blacksburg or uh, wherever you are right now. Uh, I, I know you've made a good decision uh, to decide to study and, and be a graduate student at Virginia Tech and in computer science. You've probably heard quite a bit already about things that are going on in this department. You'll hear a lot more. Um, despite the craziness uh, of the times we live in and the challenge of COVID, obviously, uh, this is still a department that's got a lot of momentum. There's a lot of growth. We're doing a lot of hiring, a lot of new faculty members joining this year, and we anticipate joining next year and, and the year after as well. Uh, several building projects going on. So we're going to have some exciting new space coming online over the next few years. So a lot of momentum uh, and our field continues to be very exciting and, and challenging and dynamic and, and uh, impactful. And I, I know that's why most of you have decided to continue you know, your graduate studies uh, in computer science. Um, you're in great hands uh, with uh, Dr. Schaefer and Hushangi as they direct the, our graduate programs, and then also certainly with Sharon and with Roxanne and others that, and Samantha that support uh, the work that you do. Don't be afraid to ask questions. I'm sure uh, that's been mentioned already, but I want to underline that. Um, and the last thing I want to say is really just, um, you know, as a graduate student in a graduate degree, it's different than an undergraduate degree. I know Chris has been talking about that from various aspects, but one of the important ways is that it, you know, you really are stakeholders uh, of the department and of, and of your program. You know, you have an opportunity to take a lot of ownership as a graduate student, especially as a research-oriented graduate student, for sure. But really, all of our graduate degrees are very much partnerships, you know, between the student and the department. We provide the context. I think we provide, you know, great support, uh, world-class research and teaching going on here. Uh, but uh, a graduate student really navigates their own path to a great extent. There's a lot of freedom in the courses you take. There's a lot of assumptions made about the fact that you all are adults and uh, are motivated uh, and are you know, intrinsically actually interested in this stuff and see it as a way to make yourself a better professional and a better person and a, and a more accomplished you know, contributor to solving the really important problems that our world has. And so uh, just, live into that, own that, reach out. It's even harder in some sense now, right? Because we can't be literally together. Uh, but so you have to take some initiative there and not be afraid to, 
to contact people, to send emails, to offer to get on a Zoom with somebody and talk through a problem or, or you know, some, some, uh, some technical thing or some even personal thing that you're dealing with. Um, you, you play an important role in that. And I think we're, we're good at making that easy and, and making that possible, but it is a partnership between the students uh, and, and us. And we always say, and, and Dr. Schaefer may have mentioned this already, again, especially as the, I'm talking to the folks who will get PhDs, which is just a subset of you, but by the time you graduate, you know, you will have turned into a, a colleague, right? You go from, it's not like an undergrad thing where we sort of just give you work to do and say, go do it, right? Here it's much more, you're, you're becoming uh, uh, our peers and our field especially changes so fast that you folks will study and, and invent and create things that, that we haven't even thought of yet. And that's super exciting. So always remember that. Um, you're, we're not trying to just download stuff on you that's received wisdom of the ages. Uh, we're trying to build an infrastructure that you guys can, you know, as we used to say at Virginia Tech, invent the future. It was a corny uh, uh, slogan, but there's a lot of truth in it. So that's all I got. Uh, have a great day and, and good luck for, for the rest of the semester. Talk to you later. Thank you. Um, I'm going to take this opportunity. I see there's a question and answer thing. Um, and I got a couple of questions there. And let me see if I can uh, shed some light on those. Um, unfortunately, let's see. The first one is there a way to see a course schedule outside of Hokie Spa? Because I know some people are dealing with um, employment paperwork and so on. And, and so the bill wasn't paid on our side because they're not an employee yet and we can't do that until you are and that means there might be some kind of a block and and so on unfortunately i don't know the answer uh possibly roxanne does if she's still here um do you know if there are any way they can see course schedules outside of hokey spa um no only the historical ones mm -hmm. like there is a there is a link to see the historical mm -hmm. um like in other words, past terms. Okay. Right. Yeah. So that's that they want to know yeah. whether they're registered for class or not. Whether, right. Right. Yeah. Um, I mean, I I I don't use Ho Hokey Spa the way the students see it. I use mm -hmm. a link for timetable, and then I can put in the um, the term like fall 2020, the campus, for instance, for me, NCR, and then you know, the, the course number or even the CRN and I can search that way or I can search for all CS classes. So I think students are able to, when I've sent people that link, they're able to do it that way. But generally, I will say that students do seem to use, I mean, when they actually register, they do it, they do it through Hokie Spa. But to search for the classes, at least that's the way I do it. I don't know if that's helpful. <laughs> so the next question here, how many were accepted out of the 900 applicants? So I got to say that um, there's different pools and they have different acceptance rates. So the, um, you know, the, the three main pools, the way we think about it, there's the Blacksburg Research Track, there's the Northern Virginia Research Track, and there's the um, MNG uh, Track. And so the MNG acceptance rate's fairly high. Um, the Blacksburg um, research track, I'd say about a third of those applicants got accepted. Um, and um, probably a bit higher for the Northern Virginia research track and then much higher for the MNG track. Um, Next question was, how are students expected to find research advisors? That's a great question. I'm glad you asked it. I'm about to spend probably about 10 minutes on that. Um, so let me get back to that in just a moment. And then let me see what's the other question. How do we find default advisors? Right. Okay. So I'll, I'll, I'll take care of those two questions naturally and what comes next. All right. So I was talking about... Um, you know, getting your degree done. And uh, the main way to get your degree done as a research track student is stay on track with the research and hit milestones and things like that. So um, let's talk about the master's students first. So in a way, I don't know, to some extent, master's student always feels just a little bit like a sprint to me. 
um, in that you don't have lots of room to maneuver. Things have to happen pretty quick to stay on track. So, um, but, well, okay, so the, the number one thing to keep in mind, number one job for every research track student this semester is get your advisor, all right? Uh, some of you already did that. Some of you walked in the door, you, you, you came with an agreement to work with somebody and everything's great that way and, 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 and so on. But I don't know, maybe a th typically about a third of the people come to campus with a pretty good idea who they're going to work with. So that leaves a lot of people who are trying to figure that out. Um, and the bad part is that uh, with the uh, pandemic, it's a little hard to get um, to get that FaceTime to interact with people. Some of the natural interactions aren't going to come so easily. So you can't literally go knock on someone's door typically. Um, so we got to, we're, we're going to have to do a little bit of, of adjustment on that. But the basic principle is the same, that you should be using a couple of tools that we give you to figure out who might be good choices. And so the two tools uh, that first come to my mind is at the graduate, oh, sorry, at the CS department, if you go to the CS department site and you click on the research link and then you click on the research areas link, you will see sort of mugshots for all of us divided by a very coarse research area. And that can help you get some sense of, you know, who might be doing stuff in an area you're interested in. And then separate from that, there is a spreadsheet. And if you go to a, a, a really useful URL for a lot, of, a lot of things besides the graduate, you know, rules page at the, at the cs.vt.edu site, there's a gpc.cs.vt.edu site. And among other things, there's a link there to a spreadsheet that lists the faculty with an indicator of how anxious they are to pick up new students. Some of us feel pretty overwhelmed with students. Some of us are really out there, you know, beating the bushes trying to get new students to, in the group. They gotta either refresh the group if they've graduated a bunch of people recently, or they're a new faculty member who's gotta build a group. And so that spreadsheet will tell you how receptive people are to, to getting new students and how hard they're going to work at it. Uh, so that's really helpful. So if you find out, oh, these people uh, look to be in my area, but this one might be hard to get them to take me, and that one's looking for new students, and that will give you some judgment. And then you start sending emails um, or any other way you can, can think of to, to get in touch with them. And you know some faculty are better about responding than others, but you know keep trying, um, and um, you know make appointments, you know do Zoom sessions with them, uh, whatever. Um, maybe you can. Some of them are operating, you know, physical oper you know, labs where there really are people there, and so on. That that's still a thing. Um, so maybe you'll get, go visit that and see what's going on at the lab. Um, the other thing you can do is talk to other grad students. So grad council, um, again, is a good source of contact and, and they have, um, they maintain a, a, a list of, um, sort of contacts from each, each, for, for each research group. Um, they're supposed to be a, a Someone, um, of course, that they've got to refresh that because a bunch of people graduated. Uh, but there should be, say, you're going to work with, you know, Dr. X, and uh, you know, who who is kind of the representative of Dr. X's research students that maybe you'll get in contact with with the research with the student as well as the faculty member and find out what's going on in that group. That, that can be a good source of information. Um, but one way or another, um, yeah, you're if. Your job is to get a research advisor by the end of the semester. In the meantime, um, I'm kind of your advisor um, if you're an MS or PhD student. And you know, feel free to ask me questions and so on. Um, be happy to, you know, I spend a lot of, lot of time doing that. Um, 
especially, you know, first couple of months, um, I expect to hear from a lot of students saying, hmm, let's see, who'd be a good person for me to work with? And what do you know about this person? What about that person? And I'm happy to have that discussion um, about, you know, who might be a good choice for you to, to start, you know, talking to. And, and uh, you know, I'm, I'm willing to say things that I know about, you know, uh, you know, pros and cons of different people and so on. But uh, you'll get even more honest information about that from the other students. And that, and that really is an issue. I'll, I'll, I'll come back to that, um, to pick a good advisor. Um, so uh, what would you do? You probably take two courses this semester. You, you're working on getting your advisor. Um, and this says pick an advisor by the end of the first year back to the MS track. Actually, you need to do better than that. You really want to have an advisor by the end of the first semester, but you, if that goes into the second semester, okay. But know this, this is, this is what's going to drive your schedule. It's pretty normal that it takes about 12 calendar months to complete a thesis. And um, if you think about what does that mean? Well, your typical MS student is going to be here four semesters, which means there's one summer in between your two normal years, if you started in fall. And it's probably going to take you 12 months to do your, your thesis. It's going to take you probably 12 months to do the research and write up the thesis and go through the iterations of that and then you know, do the defense and that sort of thing. You probably will have a face a choice. If it's going to take 12 months, you, a lot of students want to do an internship in the summer, right? That's a normal thing. And some students may do an internship and, you know, at night come and work on their thesis or they want to forget it for the summer, their thesis and just focus on their internship. That's possible. And that's, well, it's always, of course you can do that. Um, can you do that and still graduate in May of 22? That depends on how soon you got started. So if you think you're gonna be on an internship next summer, that means that you probably need to get started on your research next, this coming spring if you want to graduate on time next spring. So the MS really is something of a sprint and you got to keep focused and you got to keep making progress. The first, get that advisor, pick that research topic, start working on the research. If you'd like to go away to internship this summer with a good understanding of what your research topic is and some initial work on it, that would be putting you in good shape to graduate on time in spring 22. All right. Oh, and I got to warn you that the reality is by the way things work, there are, you, you, you have to defend. There's a deadline for that to graduate that semester or an, an even tighter deadline if you want to be at the graduation ceremony that semester, which by spring of 22, we certainly would hope and expect there are graduation ceremonies. Um, you got to get done by the deadline, which is not, you know, the end of the semester. It's before that. You can't defend unless you've submitted the final draft of your, of your thesis or dissertation two weeks before that, because you got to schedule it two weeks before that. But you're going to have to go through iterations of writing that thing up with your advisor. Basically, it comes down to if you want to graduate in May of 22, you're going to have to have your thesis written by the beginning of March of 22. And if you want to get that done, you're going to have to be doing research this summer on your, on your, on your thesis project. All right. PhD, um, that's kind of an in-depth and we're very much a kind of an apprenticeship model. Um, we're really training you to be an independent researcher. Um, you know, it's a lot of credits, but most of those are just research hours. Um, Getting the credits is not the thing that's going to determine when you graduate. It's getting the dissertation done that's going to determine when you graduate. And there's a few milestones along the way. So there's the first major milestone is something called the qualifier, PhD qualifier. And there's different pieces to that. 
part of that is taking like four classes and getting a reasonable grades in them. And the other part is a mix of PhD qualifier exam and research. So you get points on those two things and you have to get enough points out of the two of them. I don't want to go into too much detail on that. Be aware that for most PhD students, next, not this January, not January of 21, most PhD students, you should assume that you're going to take the PhD qualifier in January of 22. If you're coming to us with a master's degree already, you might consider taking the PhD qualifier exam this January, but most PhD students will take it next January. The next major hurdle for PhD students is called the prelim proposal and the preliminary exam. That's usually done around the end of the third year, maybe beginning of the fourth year in the program. Then there's a, a little mini milestone called the research defense. That's just right before your final defense. That's to make sure that your committee's happy with the work you've done and that nothing's gonna go wrong on the final defense. That's not a major milestone. Then the big milestone, both for MS and PhD students, the last big milestone is called the final defense, um, where for the thesis for the MS and the dissertation for the PhD students, where it's the classic thing, you know, you, you've written your document, you've given it to the committee, they've read it, you give a presentation, they ask a whole lot of questions, and then they decide whether you pass or not. Most people pass because you shouldn't have gotten, your advisor shouldn't have let you get there if you're not ready to pass. Most important decision in graduate school for any research track student is your advisor. More so for the PhD student than the MS student because when you're an MS student, you got to live with this person for about a year and you know most people can live with most people for about a year. If you're a PhD student, you're gonna live with them for three to five years, and that's a pretty intense relationship. They've gotta be someone who, who works with you in the right way for you. And everyone's got their own management style. And, and you know, a, one of the dirty secrets of academia, PhD level is, faculty were not hired at, because of their management skills. And so some faculty are better managers than others. They can handle more or less students. They have styles of management. They're very hands-on or they're very hands-off. Certain students need someone who's very hands-on. Other students need someone who's more hands-off. And you gotta have that good match uh, for that to succeed. It's not just, can they give you a, a research assistantship? It's not just, are they the famous person in the field? Is it, is it someone is, who, can, who can manage you in a way that works for you? Is it a topic that you can live and breathe for years and be happy with doing that because you've got a passion for it? Those things have to fit or you're not gonna be very happy as a PhD student. And, that, and if you're not happy as a PhD student, it's very hard to succeed. So who you pick is really important. All right, how do you find out? Talk to people, talk to their students, talk to me, talk to other faculty, uh, uh, talk to lots of faculty, find out what they do, try and get a sense of what they're like, what it would be like to work with them, All right? Um, that's really important. You might want to do a trial period with a research group. Maybe you'll do an independent study uh, one semester or something like that, or a, or, you know, a, a couple month project with them. Um, and if you start with somebody, um, say late this semester, and you go into spring, and you come to the realization by the end of spring that they just are not the right group or the right faculty advisor for you, for a PhD student, that is no problem. Um, if you switch at the end of your first year, that's not likely to have a huge impact on your graduation time. Now, if you work for someone, if you, if you work for someone this year and it's not a great fit, but it seems tolerable and you keep banging away at it and you go on for two years into your third year 
and it's just not working and you just can't keep with them and you got to switch, that will impact your graduation time. Switching and doing a cold start with a new research professor after two to three years, that's going to take time. Um, that's going to delay your graduation. Jumping on, working with someone this year wasn't a great fit. You switch next fall, no problem. You can recover from that and graduate on time. All right. Okay. So, um, talk to people, talk to research groups, talk to advisors, find out what people are doing, do this as soon as you can. This is an important reason why you're not taking three, four classes this semester, especially if you're a TA. If you take two classes and you're a TA and you're looking for a research advisor, that is more, those three things are more than a full-time job together. Um, you, you can't take more than two classes and expect to find a research advisor and start a research program, especially if you're a TA. So that's why we keep, that's why we're telling you courses is not the thing. You're not here to take courses. They help, but that's not your reason for being in a research track. All right. So as it says here, if you're in the PhD program, you're probably gonna take the PhD qualifier next, not this January, but the following January. If you're a PhD student and you don't have a master's degree, a natural question is, do you need a master's degree? And the answer is no, um, but you probably would feel better if you pick up a master's degree along the way. Um, and some advisors might have slightly different attitudes about that, but, but generally most people have come to the consensus that if you're a PhD student, the sooner you think about the, the end goal, the better the sooner you're thinking toward a dissertation topic and so on, the better. And while you're at it, yeah, sure, after two years, we'll, we'll fill out the paperwork to give you your master's, basically. That's, what, that's how you want to structure it. If you have a graduate degree already, you can transfer courses, but that's not something we really need to worry about this week or next week. We can worry about that later. But you can transfer, you, you have to have a majority of your courses done here. So if you're a master's student, seven classes, half of that, less than half is three. If you're nine for PhD, less than half of that is four. All right. Actually, Cliff, if you don't mind, I'll just add to that. Um, so some, some, most of my PhD students who have decided to do a master's on the way end up doing a master's coursework only, non-thesis right. on the way. Right. Or I'm sorry, were you going to do that in the next slide or no? Yeah, I, I can. I can explain that a little bit. Um, yeah, so basically all you need to do to pick up the coursework version of the along the way is um, you, you've, you've, you will have, you have created your PhD plan of study, so you know the nine courses you're going to take. That would be your MS plan of study, add in an independent study class, but you shouldn't really have to do anything for that independent study class your faculty advisor should be happy to just sign at the end of the semester. Yeah, they've been doing research work. Done, right? Um, and, you, and, and this assumes that you've passed your, prelim, your, your, your qualifier process, your PhD qualifier. Basically, um, take the exam, get at least a point, um, or otherwise have passed the qualifier. Those are the three things. Your, your MS plan of study plus an independent study that ought to be free and your PhD qualifier and done, that's it. Basically, no extra work. Yeah, so you just let your coordinator know, submit the plan of study. You will have to apply for a degree for the master's on the way. And anyway, there's a different way of doing it, We, um, but your folks, uh, Sharon and I can explain that. Yeah, thanks. And again, yeah, that, that's where the grad coordinators um, know the mechanics. So. How you do a plan, of, I mean, I know about plan of study. I know how to read a plan of study. I know how to sign the form. I can tell you whether it's acceptable list of courses. What happens then, that's magic to me. I don't know what goes on. That's what, that's what Roxanne knows how to do, how to negotiate with the grad school, how to get it on to the Hokie Banner, actually. Banner, right, yeah. Um, 
how do you actually get your master's degree when you're a PhD student? I, I don't know. I know what happens. They know how to make it happen. Right. So you got to keep that, you know, the, the, the grad coordinators know the mechanics. I know the policy. All right. So speaking of mechanics and policy, you know, transfer courses, again, a uh, perfect example of this. So um, the way that actually happens is there's a, a transfer form, right? There's a form for everything. And you'll take that and you'll go to uh, someone who knows about a given course and they will make the determination. They'll either decide that the thing you took matches well enough to an actual course that you get credit for that actual course. That's one possible outcome. Another possible outcome is that they'll say, well, here's a course in, I don't know, quantum computing, and we don't have one of those on the books right now, but that looks reasonable. If we had one, we would give you credit for this. And so we'll count that as credit in an area. And so we'd figure out what the best area match is. And it won't be a specific course, but it'll be a three credit course in an area. So that'll help satisfy, say, your area requirements. And it'll help satisfy, you know, the seven or nine course requirement, credit courses. Um, and, but it just isn't a specific course. It's in an area. And that's fine. No problem. And that's just as good. Um, and so what will happen is you'll go to a faculty member. They'll, you'll take them whatever your case is. You'll tell them, you, you'll take them whatever documentation they need to know what that course was about. Maybe they'll want um, a syllabus. They'll probably want to know what textbooks you used, if you used one. Maybe they'll need to know something about the homework assignments, whatever it takes for them to be happy. Um, and then they'll sign the form. And then you'll send that to the grad coordinator. And they basically, I think, what well, you just hold on to that until um, the plan of study gets filed, at which point that's when they actually push that stuff up in the banner, right? I'm pretty sure that's how that works. But for now, all you need to care about is just getting someone to sign off on that form. But you don't need that this week. You can, you know, that can wait a month. That's not a big hurry because, again, nothing actually happens until the plan of study gets filed. But it's good to get them settled, good to get them decided. Okay, now I just went through this. Um, all right, too much on transfers. Um, I've talked about you need to be full-time, 12 credits per semester. Um, you do need to maintain at least the 3.0 GPA. Actually, I, I'm not sure what our median GPA is. It's like, a, I don't know, a 3.7 or something. Most people have over a 3.5 as a grad student. Um, file your plan of study on time and so on. One thing I didn't talk about, yeah, okay. Um, so, um, there's a there's a something called a SAR student activity report and there's an event called Green Thursday which is actually more of a process than an event that's the annual evaluation process this is modeled on what faculty go through we do the same thing every year we write a report that says everything we did this year and if the department head and the personnel committee are happy with us we get a raise and if they're not happy with us, we don't get a raise and, and all that kind of thing. And if they're really not happy with us, I guess they can fire us. But it's all based on this activity report called an FAR, Faculty Activity Report. And every year, personnel committee evaluates us. They read the report and write some notes and stuff and, and give us feedback. Well, we put you through really an identical process to what we go through. Every year you write a report, and in your case, it's a bit structured and it's nowhere near as onerous as my report. Um, you write a report that says, you know, what you did this year. Um, and you may, if you have some publications, you'll list those. And if you gave some presentations, you'll list those. And if you were a TA, you'll, you'll, you'll note that. And if you're a research assistant and so on, and who you're working with. And then your advisor will write an evaluation that you will see uh, to give you feedback about how you're doing. And then we have this event called Green Thursday, where basically, um, 
I and the other members of something called Graduate Program Committee, which is kind of the committee that oversees the graduate program. So I, I manage the program, but they help set the policy and oversee things. Um, collectively, basically, we, we talk to the advisors and, and um, obviously we spend more time talking about people who are, who are concerned than people who are doing fine. Um, and then I basically um, at a given evaluation also. So by May or June, you should have gotten a re, uh, an evaluation from your advisor and an evaluation from me to say how you're doing. And that affects things. Um, that's an important process of knowing, it's like formative, formative evaluation in the sense you know how you're doing and summative evaluation in the sense that um, we use this. We use it for GTA assignment or, you know, when, when we give GTA, some people got a promise up front for some period of funding and, and, and unless they get bad evaluations, of course, we'll honor that. Um, but then if you're not promised funding, you go on the, on the wait list and, and you get credit toward the wait list. So it's, it's, it's designed in a way <clears throat> that PhD students in particular, but master's students as well, who are making progress toward their degree and getting good evaluations, they get credit for all those things. And so they'll um, be high on the wait list and get, and get the position. Now, some of you coming in uh, came in with a GTA offer and some of you got put on the wait list and got one and some of you got put on the wait list and you didn't get one because, um, you know, honestly, the people who, don't get um, the GTA offer up front and get put on the wait list, you're kind of last in line behind people who are already in the program and have already built credit toward that. Now, even if you didn't get a GTA this semester, um, you being in the program gets you a little ahead on the wait list. So new students coming in in spring, for example, will be in line behind you. Um, next fall, you'll be way far up. If you've been doing well, if you've got a research advisor and everything, and you're doing fine, you're that much further up toward the top. And so the odds of getting uh, um, a GTA next year are much higher. And once people get a GTA, we don't, we tend not to let them go. Um, they get, you get extra credit for having done a good job before. So if you're a GTA and you're at least doing a normal job, um, that builds more credit. So once you're in the system, you tend to stay in the system. All right. So I know a few of you are concerned. Some people, you know, we admit more people than we can give a, a, a GTA for, um, but you, you may not get it this semester, but your odds will keep going up. All right, so this Green Thursday process is an important part of all of that, because that's one of the things that gets you points towards GTAs. Um, another issue to uh, talk about is um, some grad school requirements and, and um, ethics principles related to that. So um, a lot of our system, a lot of academia is built on trust. And you're used to seeing that from the standpoint of I'm a student in the class and I won't cheat on my exams and things like that. And there's um, processes and honor codes and process for dealing with violations of honor codes and so on. Um, in the same way, from the research perspective, there's um, ethics requirements about, you know, you really did the work you claim you did. Um, you, didn't, you, you didn't fabricate the results. You didn't steal it from someone else and things like that. There are requirements um, about training related to that. Um, that comes in a couple of different flavors. One flavor that comes in is if you're a GTA or a GRA, there's maybe online courses you're required to take. There's a conflict of interest course. There may be a human subjects course. You know, it depends on what your, um, what your occupation, you know, whether you're a GTA or a GRA. Different people take different courses at different times. These little online things that really don't take very long to do. There's another training process, um, and that is um, requirements from the grad school that every graduate student has to fulfill. And there's two in particular. One is related to scholarly ethics, and the other is included to, uh, related to inclusion and diversity. 
the way every department has to handle those in some way and the way that we handle those is by bundling them into two courses the research methods course and the ethics and professionalism course everyone has to take one of them if you're mn you're taking 5024 that's required if you're a ms or phd you get your choice of which to take because we cover the necessary material in both of those courses so um and and it 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 and those tend to be popular courses anyway um so aside from from cover that requirement if that if those if those requirements weren't there most people would take one of these courses anyway um but since we are also using them to satisfy the grad school requirement that means everyone ends up taking one of them Um, I talked a little bit about funding. Um, the main ways that students in the department get funding is through a GRA or a GTA. GRAs are offered by faculty members individually. GTAs are offered by the department. Um, and there's, I think we have 100 GTA positions this semester. GRAs fluctuate, but I think that's over 100. There's also other sources of funding on campus, um, although I appreciate with COVID and stuff, it's a little harder to find out and get in contact and so on. But um, other departments hire our students, both as GTAs and GRAs, because computer scientists are always in demand. Um, there are some fellowship opportunities. You've probably seen some email already, uh, which doesn't apply to you quite yet, because it tends to be for people already into the program. But there's fellowships from Microsoft, there's fellowships from Google, there's NSF fellowships, there's a couple of university fellowships, things come along. Um, there aren't big numbers of those, but they're there. So there's a lot of different you know, ways that people can get funded. All right. um, Grad Council has a pool of money they're given for um, what used to be travel funding, um, now still, if, if you're going to be uh, giving a presentation at a conference and the conference is a registration fee, that they might cover that. Um, hopefully it won't be that long before people are traveling again and then we'll go back to covering travel expenses. Uh, you know, typically that's done by a mix of, um, you know, the, the research advisor and, and grad council funding pool. Um, and then uh, also mentioned social events, grad council, um, hopefully we'll have, have some again. Again, we're, we're challenged by uh, the, the physical distancing issues, um, but uh, hopefully there'll be some events that they'll, they'll, they'll keep you aware of. Uh, sort of wrapping up here, a couple of things. Um, keep a balance, especially don't go crazy with being locked in your apartment and in COVID, um, but keep a balance of, you know, your work and, and your, um, and the rest of your life. Um, you know, especially the, I, I keep saying that the, 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 one of the defining features of graduate students is they have to play so many roles. They have to wear so many hats. You're, you're a student, you're a teacher, you're, you're a student researcher, you're a colleague, you're a mentor, you are a mentee, you're all these things at once, uh, very many of us. Um, and you gotta learn how to balance that. Um, you, know, you should be treating this as kind of a full-time job, but just like a full-time job that's you know, in the vicinity of 40 hours a week, not, not 160 hours a week, because that's impossible. Um, so you, you know, think about, and if you feel like you're having trouble with that, uh, talk to your advisor, talk to me, talk to um, Cook Counseling Center, um, lots of people you can talk to about how to keep the right perspective, how to keep these things balanced. Um, and so I'll just close with just a couple of things to do. Um, get your CS account, go to admin.cs.vt.edu, click on create account. If you haven't done it already, do something about your email so that you're getting your uh, vt.edu traffic at wherever you normally read your email. 
and start looking over the grad handbook, start looking over the, the grad rules. All right, that's my presentation. I'm happy to answer questions. All right, let me try and uh, take a look at the, at the questions in the chat. Oh, let's see, first of all, there's a Q and A, let's see. Oh, okay, so here's a couple more questions. Um, let me see if I can answer some of these. Let me catch up. There's a whole bunch of bunch of questions here in the question and answer. Um, all right, what's the process like when deciding to research in the ECE professor? So let me uh, say a little bit about um, getting an advisor and how that relates to outside departments. So you have to have an advisor. You can have co-advisors. Um, we have requirements in the department for the committees as to how many are regular um, CS department faculty. You can have an advisor who's out of the department or a co-advisor. There's different ways that faculty members not in the department are affiliated with the department. And you can go to uh, the site, the, the, I think it's under the people link, and there's a, there's a page about faculty who are affiliated with CS and there's different ways that can work. Sign of the gold, the, the gold standard affiliation is what's called a courtesy appointment. And that gives, uh, the main thing that that does is gives th that person the right to advise students in the department that they have the courtesy appointment in. Um, and there are a few people who do that. The other thing is any faculty member on campus could be a co-advisor along with a CS faculty member. So you can, and we have quite a few CS grad students who have an advisor or co-advisor in a related discipline. ECE is a popular related discipline. There's a lot of overlap. I will say that um, I find that there is a little bit of danger that a student can go to an advisor in one of these other departments and kind of get lost to the CS and not keep uh, connections, which isn't a big deal if things are good. But I had, for example, there I, I had a horror story just last week where someone basically ended up not getting supported. They thought they were going to be supported by this person because they were in the summer and they aren't. And it's not in our department and not in our control. I've had a couple of cases in the past where someone is in a lab somewhere in another department and not getting advice about how our program works and and they didn't pan out well with that advisor and they kind of were, were you know kind of lost and stuck and it took them a little while to get reintegrated back into CS. I do, I do recommend that you have a co-advisor in CS, even if your main advisor is in another department. Um, but definitely, it is a thing. There are plenty of, of happy relationships where, with an advisor in an outside department. Um, let's see. Um, after Thanksgiving, are we still required to be around campus? Um, probably, almost certainly not, because nothing official is going to be happening on campus at that point. Everything's online after Thanksgiving. In essence, I think the undergrads are basically going to get kicked off at campus. Those who are living in the dorms are going to get kicked off anyway. Um, okay, if I living quarters aren't suitable office, what can you do for office space? That's where the research groups come into play. So if you can get connected with the research group um, and men mostly, like for example, I have a research group, I have a lab space um, that the students, and I was fortunate that when I polled my students, you know, we could only support half the students that we normally have in here and keep to the restrictions, but only half my students wanted to come anyway. So I was able to give a, a desk space to the ones who wanted it. Um, similarly, uh, most research groups have uh, some, re some office space. So you talk to them. There's room in Knowledge Works uh, for, for grad students to have desks and so on. So there are possibilities for that. There's also spaces on campus, for example, um, in the library. 
you know, there, there's, it's understood that there's reasons why people want to come on campus, better internet connection, peace and quiet, whatever, and the, the university tries to accommodate in different ways. Should we be getting IEEE or similar? Um, I certainly do advise everybody to be um, a member, a student member of either ACM or IEEE. Those are our two main professional societies. Um, in IEEE, it would be the IEEE Computer Society. IEEE is a bit bigger and broader. So I would say our number one professional society is ACM and our number two society is IEEE but that's because I'm a computer scientist. So um, ECE, ECE people would be an IEEE. And it's cheap. For student memberships, pretty cheap. And it's, it's definitely worthwhile. Um, accelerated MS program to 4,000 level undergrad classes can be counted as the reverse supply. Well, just in general, um, and then, and then there's the cybersecurity minor and things like that. Let me, let me just say a few things about just the rules on classes, regardless of who you are. So first off, um, our, our program, our MS or PhD has rules. And one of them is that you can count up to two 4,000 level classes. So it doesn't really matter whether you're an accelerated undergrad, grad student, or and double counting them or not. That's a separate issue, double counting you can count to 4,000 level classes. Um, likewise, another rule to be aware of is a course can be counted for at most two things. And by thing, I mean certificate or degree. Some people um, want to get a certificate and they want to get a master's, they want to get a PhD, and they might even get a master's in another program as well. So it's not uncommon that particularly it goes in our direction in that someone's a PhD student in another department and they want an MS master's. There's a lot of people who want that. A given course can be applied to two things. It can be applied to an MS and a PhD. It could be applied to a PhD and a certificate. A number of people get um, the future professorate certificate. That's very popular in our department. Um, and a given course could be applied to two of these things. So just be a little careful. If you're getting an MS and a PhD and a certificate in bioinformatics and a future professorate, any given course could only apply to two of them. All right. Um, is it better to have the research methods class in fall to help new grad students? Uh, no. Um, and in fact, we always have this issue, when, when should students who want to take 5014 research methods, when should they take that? And the answer is when you're far enough along, but not too far along. And, the, and what I mean by that is you want to take research methods when the assignments for that class will dovetail with your research. It so happens that I will be teaching that class next spring. And for uh, some of you, that may be the right time. If you have started your research program and you will be in a position where you would be get benefit out of writing abstract about your research, writing a proposal about your research, and things like that, that's the time to do it. Now, if you've already taken, done, written your prelim or something, uh, for your MS, you're in your third year as a PhD student, it's probably too late to do you really the most good. And if it were your first semester and you don't know what your research is going to be, again, it's too early to do you any good. You want to do it when you're just getting started working on your research and you're trying to sort that out and being forced to write about it will help you get it sorted out. That's the right time. So for some of you, next spring will be fine. For some of you, you might wait till next year. I'm an NCR campus. Can I ask a professor in Blacksburg to be my advisor? Sure. We've got people uh, in Blacksburg who have NCR advisors, and we have people at NCR of Blacksburg advisors. It can, it can go either way. We are one department, especially with Zoom. How would you know the difference, right? Am I sitting in Blacksburg? Am I sitting in Northern Virginia? How do you know, right? What difference does it make? Um, so, yes, you can. 
Um, sorry, I've come in line. We'll get corded orientation. Yeah, this is being taped. We'll post it. Um, let's see. Uh, FERPA section. I'm not sure. Um, yeah, there is a question about a FERPA form. I'm, at that, I, I'm afraid I don't know about that, but um, if you're going to have to do your, your paperwork, so probably that'll they'll go to Sharon and she'll straighten it out, Sharon or Tabitha, whoever's handling that, your paperwork. Um, at this point, the GTAs have been pretty well decided. Um, is there funding for MS students to attend a conference? The answer is yes. Um, uh, um, sorry, this thing's, thing's blinking on here. Um, I'm sorry, I think I missed. Um, yeah, there, there's, I'm, I'm not so used to this question and answer thing, and I guess someone's moving them to the answered section for me. Um, funding for MS I'm students. Doing that. Right. Um, MS students to attend a conference. Again, um, your, your, your research advisor, if you're giving a presentation at a conference, then um, someone's probably going to pay for it for you. Either your research advisor through their grant money or grad council, grad council may contribute to that through the travel fund. Um, now, the issue is, I mean, generally that goes to people who are giving a, a presentation, uh, but not always. Sometimes uh, research groups, they'll, they'll all go off to the conference, especially if it's close. Um, there's a question, how do you join the professional groups? Um, Actually, maybe send that by email, uh, and maybe I can post some things about that. Um, but both ACM and IEEE, they regularly send around mailings. Uh, they got websites and stuff, and I'd be happy to post some more information about that. All right. And I think I pretty well answered the, the questions. Because the other two that are open, I think I answered earlier. All right. Let me see, is there anything over in this other channel? Anything else? Anything else I can answer? Um, if not, then uh, that's, I wish everybody a, a happy, successful um, semester. Um, there's an issue about the I-9. Talk to Tabitha about that if you haven't already been through the paperwork on that. She'll tell you how to take care of that. This was a question about I-9 forms. All right. Um, how do we find interesting professor's office hours? Um, there, there is actually a, a page that posts everybody's office hours. Um, and um, that uh, probably over the, early over the course of the semester, um, they'll collect all that and post all of that. Um, there should, you might wanna send me an email about that because I don't happen to remember where that's linked from. It's probably, there's a link from the main CS site is my guess, but I don't remember for certain, but I do know that that does get, posted when people standing office hours will be. And I need to, I guess, talk to the faculty about mechanisms for, for, for students to contact them. But they, they know what's going on there. All right. Um, all right. And there is a question about GLC, which a few people are, are living on campus. That's kind of the grad housing. Um, you'd have to ask them uh, as to how they're gonna how they're gonna handle things post Thanksgiving. I, I'm afraid I don't know the answer to that. All right. Well, thank you, everybody, and um, I, I thank you for coming. And and again, don't hesitate to uh, send. Uh, emails to appropriate people and there's again there's there's lots to pick up there's lots to learn it's going to be a learning process but uh, 
Um, so don't worry about asking the questions and, and uh, I hope you have a successful semester. Thank you. Thank you, Kalef. All right. Did you see the last question? Somebody else has asked about GLC. Yeah, that was what I was just trying to say. It's um, really that they'd have to ask them about that. People can live in GLC? Yeah, that's, mm -hmm. I mean, there there aren't a huge amount of okay. apartments there, but oh, there is grad housing there. Grad yeah. housing there? That's yeah. Good. A couple of people are just saying thank you, thank mm -hmm. you. We still have a bunch of people online. Mm -hmm. Cliff, thank you. That was so, it was such a great introduction to the entire Thanks. program. And I feel like I know, I've learned so much more about it. And I really like your statement of we are one department. Because <laughs> it's, it's a great, because it, I get, I receive that questions a lot. And it's like, we are one department. That was just mm -hmm. really nice. <laughs> Even more than ever, you know. <laughs> yeah. I talk. I talk to you two more, a lot more than I talk to most people in in Blacksburg. <laughs> too many emails, Cliff. <laughs> no, not too many. Okay. <laughs> the annoying S&S. <laughs> mm -hmm. No, I'm only kidding. You get another question. Somebody's asking about two degrees and a certificate. Yeah, you got a do a little dance with that because um, it's mostly the certificate. Um, again, a, and this is not my rule, this is a case of a grad school rule. Um, they'll only let you count it. A, any given course can only count toward two things. So um, you'll probably end up having to take a couple extra classes to, to keep those things sorted out so that nothing got used more than twice. And I'm happy, you know, if you if you get to the point of a plan of study and you want to know, you know, can I can I use them in this way, you know, I'm happy to to look at that and see whether that'll be acceptable to the grad school or not. All right. Well, great. Thank you. I'm gonna head off. Right. Me Thank too. Thank you for the information. All Bye. right. Bye. See you tomorrow. Bye. <laughs> yeah.